You will hear a man phoning to inquire about hotel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly, could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours, and you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes, we have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts where we run a popular doubles tournament with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, Guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes with our Michelin-starred chef Enrique. 
The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan Hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter before being transported to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh, wow! That all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions 11 to 20. You now have some time to read questions 11 to 20 first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university. So make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area, the place for returned books and other items, is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed Reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on Closed Reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level 2 only. On level 2 are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the Audiovisual Resource Centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audiovisual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, 
These work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone, and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues, or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? Of course, please come in. I'm Charlotte York. I'm considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents, and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject, and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now, I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favourite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, 
you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with a polytechnic? Yes, I have. I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university, so I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money, and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. OK, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. OK, Japanese. Got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses or dealing with injuries outside, although it's not essential. So, OK, if it's useful, I'll take it. If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry as it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Complete the notes made by one of the students present. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest and I specialize in management techniques and training.
I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to four billion pounds a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers. And not a conscious effort to attack someone, but that is perhaps a case of、um, of my being naive or over hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points.、Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes, right. Off we go. Now answer questions thirty-four to forty. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management; it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice. With offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action, I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes. Okay. You've got twenty minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.
I got the cash in the bag, stadium pack Born a rock star in this life, gone live it up on the attack Baby, I'm bad, I just wanna get caught up in this life I'm crazy, I'm mad, doing no cap Only God wants you, better go live it up, cash in the bag, stadium pack Baby, I'm bad the pie charts below give information on the ages of populations of Oman and Spain in 2005 and projection for 2055 so 2055 the projection is also there so the graph is of the future summarize information and by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant so we are given the ages of the population of Oman and Spain in 2005 and 2055 and the projection for 2055 or 2055 so in 2005 we can see that 60 plus year 48 percent population is of old age golden age of 60 plus years and then 0 to 14 years are 48 percent both are same but if we talk about 15 to 59 years only 4 percent of the population is of the year is of the age category 15 to 59 years in sorry was i was saying is so it was uh, in 2005 in oman now if we talk about the projection if we talk about in future what will happen we can see there is a uh, an increase in the year of the golden age 57 percent would be of the year 60 plus and for the year 0 to 14 years 37 percent so it will increase hugely like for four percent to sorry it will decrease yeah it was 48 percent and it will become 37 percent in 2055 2055 so from the year 15 to 59 year if we talk about like four percent to just six percent an increase of two percent only so the projection remain you know similar to the uh, year 2005 now if we talk about Spain, here also similarly we can see that uh, the golden ages were more 62% in 2005 and 4 to 14 years 14% people were of the age group 4 to 14 years now and a quarter nearly a quarter 24% people were of the age 15 to 59 years. Now, if we talk about the projection that what will happen in future, uh, this will decrease. Like the people of the age category 60 plus years will reduce to 46%. And this will increase and will become nearly double, right? 15 to 59 years, it will be 42%. Nearly double because it would be, you know, 48. It has to be 48 and then it will be 12 percent the reduction of two percent will be there in the future so let's have a look how we can write this now starting with rephrasing the rendered pie charts depict the ratio of individuals in three different age groups residing in spain and oman in 2005 and the prediction for 2000, 2055 and the production, the future prediction. Overall, the number of senior people in Oman would rise, whereas the number of middle aged person in Spain is expected to grow by 2055. So what we can see is an increase and a huge increase can be seen in the year 60 plus. If we talk about Oman and if we talk about uh, Spain, there will be an uh, increase in the number of uh, age category five, 15 to 59. So that's why we are saying middle aged person in Spain is expect, expected to grow. Explicitly in 2005, the proportion of people in the 0 to 14 and 60 plus age groups both accounted for 48 percent. That was similar in Oman. Only 4 percent of people aged 15 to 59 were in this category. Okay, so in this category, only 4 percent of people were there. However, the ratio of senior citizens uh, is anticipated, is expected to be 57 percent in 2055. The percentile of children under 14 will drop to 37 percent. So the percentage will drop of the age category under 14 while the probability of adults will rise minimally by 2% the probability means the projection would increase by just 2% so that's why we are writing minimally 
Now, in 2005, more than half of the population in Spain, 62%, was over 60 years old, which is expected to fall to 46%. So, the expectation is there would be decrease in this uh, age category. The population will decrease of this age category. Similarly, children under 14 were 14% 14 in 2005, but predicted to decline by 4%. So, there will be a 4% decline. No. The decline will be of 2% because it was of 14% and it has to be, it will be 12% after 5 decades. People aged 15 to 59 were nearly a quarter of the population, 24%. However, after 50 years, the figure is foreseen to be 42%. The projection is of 42%. So this was for today. If you like the video, do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'll meet you in the next video. Till then, bye bye and take care.